being here. You want to say a few words about joint venture? I would love to do that. Barry, thank you for, uh, thank you to you and to all of your colleagues for organizing this webinar. And thank you to everybody who's participating. Uh, I have the great privilege of serving as the president and CEO of this organization. It's called Joint Venture Silicon Valley. It also houses an institute. I'm the president of the institute. That institute is called the Silicon Valley Institute for Regional Studies. The organization exists to do um, three things. We bring together Silicon Valley's leaders, and I'm referring to the leaders across every major sector. So Silicon Valley is a place where um, uh, elected officials, uh, uh, CEOs, uh, labor leaders, college and university presidents, all of them sit down together. And the reason we sit down is to talk about our region, its health, its vitality, what our challenges are, what our opportunities might be, and how we can mobilize to address them. So that's the first thing we do. The second thing is we provide the analysis out of our institute, and we try to understand Silicon Valley and its ecosystem in a very sophisticated way, and then we provide the data and the reports. And then finally, uh, we tackle problems. And uh, we work on any kind of problem. If it, if it affects our health and vitality, then joint venture will tackle the problem. Uh, but we feel and have felt for um, more than a decade that the biggest problem facing Silicon Valley is the same problem that's facing the planet, and that would be climate. Uh, and so we have prioritized uh, climate change and sustainability issues at Joint Venture. And that's, uh, that's why uh, uh, great people like Barry have joined our team and we're, we're proud of that. Uh, we think it's priority simply because it's a planetary <clears throat> emergency. We also think it's a priority because we view it as an opportunity for Silicon Valley to provide leadership. And we think that we should be a national leader in the same way that California should be a national leader and a world leader. We also think that the solutions should be coming from Silicon Valley, particularly out of our tech sector in that the innovation that will be driving those solutions also represents an enormous opportunity to grow the economy, to create jobs and to, um, and, uh, and to do the most meaningful things that we must be doing during a, a planetary emergency. So that's why we're here. I love my job. I love working with people like Barry. And um, with that, I'll turn the reins back over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Russ, uh, for that. And um, I'm going to share my screen here. Just a moment. Okay. So um, this webinar, as I mentioned earlier, is brought uh, to you by a partnership between Joint Venture Silicon Valley, the Climate Center, and Terra Verde. I am working both uh, for the Climate Center and also uh, as part of Joint Venture Silicon Valley's climate leadership team. Uh, so I just want to say a few things about um, our one of our big initiatives, which is Climate Safe California. Uh, but before I do, I want to give you a sense of what the agenda is for our program today. Um, so uh, my colleague, Janelle London, uh, is going to talk a little bit about another one of a part of our initiative uh, on uh, to address climate change. Uh, beyond gasoline after I speak, and she'll address that briefly. And then we'll get to our main feature, which is uh, David Burdick from Terra Verde Energy, uh, talking about how to get more out of your existing solar and storage systems. And we'll have uh, time after that, ample time for Q&A. So we hope you will all stay for that. Um, that will be uh, a very important part of our time together today. Uh, and then we'll do a short wrap at the end. So, what I want to say about Climate Safe California is that in a nutshell, it's bringing California's uh, target uh, for, for greenhouse gas emissions reductions and policies to address climate change in alignment with the current science. So I think we all felt like we crossed the threshold in the beginning of September and that day when it didn't seem like the sun rose and we had that horrible orange pall to the sky. And uh, this LA Times headline really sums it up, California's climate apocalypse. And I think we viscerally experienced that the impacts are happening faster than we thought they would. Um, 
and are more devastating. So this is a, a, a slide is based on a piece of research recently, and there's been a lot of new climate research in the last year, year and a half, um, that basically says we're experiencing impacts faster than they predicted even a couple of years ago. Um, and what this says is that we have activated nine out of 15 global tipping points. And this is important for two reasons. One, they didn't think we'd be at this point for another couple of decades. Number two, these points, as you can see by the arrows connecting the letters, are, are interactive. So the melting uh, of the Greenland ice sheet, which is happening faster than predicted, uh, affects C, the thermo Atlantic thermohaline conveyor, which affects A, the Amazon, and the drought we're experiencing in the Amazon and undermines the Western and Eastern An Antarctic ice sheets. Uh, so, um, you know, this is a system that we've put into place and what um, Johan Rockström, who was the lead author of this study from the Potsdam Institute said, was that we underestimated um, uh, the rapidity of these positive feedback loops for climate change um, and that we must act now, we have about a decade to uh, address this before we get to an uninhabitable hothouse climate earth. Uh, so we need more aggressive policies. And what we're recommending is that by 2025, California will have enacted the bold policies required by science to dramatically reduce emissions, start drawdown and secure resilient communities by 2030 which we believe will inspire global action. And just to be very clear about the target, the target is by 2030 to get 80% below 1990 levels of GHG emissions and net negative emissions, which means we are, would be sequestering uh, more carbon than we are actually adding to the atmosphere um, so that California becomes a net carbon sink by 2030. Uh, the nation and the world are really looking to California to lead for a climate safe uh, future. And we have the natural resources, we have the human resources, we have technologies, we have the belief that climate change is a very serious policy priority, but still California is falling behind in the policy domain. So guiding principles for climate safe California are three. I've already made it one, mentioned once, one of them, which is we must uh, follow the latest science in all our targets, policies, and programs. We also believe that we have to ensure a just transition for fossil fuel workers, and that we must prioritize climate justice to ensure lower income communities are no longer disproportionately harmed by fossil fuels. And I should also say, are, since that's what we're talking about today, are benefited by the clean energy and other climate mitigation measures we take going forward. Our house is on fire. So we are reaching out to uh, governments and businesses all over California, but particularly in Silicon Valley. Um, so if you are open to doing a presentation, my doing a presentation before your, uh, the appropriate team at your company or your city council, um, my email address there is at the bottom. Uh, please shoot me an email. Uh, I would love to uh, get your endorsement and how we will use those is we are already submitting uh, legislative language for the policies that will be required in the 2020 um, California legislative session to take us towards Climate Safe California's bold 2030 goal. And I just want to say that this is not all like gloom and doom stuff. Yes, climate change is a huge threat, but it is also a huge opportunity. Jigger Shaw calls it the biggest wealth generation opportunity of our times. Not only is it cheaper to address climate change now rather than later, but investments at the scale required will stimulate our economy, creating new companies and jobs, increase our global competitiveness, decrease downtime from power outages, improve national security and improve health outcomes. And all of this is possible using current technology. So the challenge today is um, we have about 670 endorsements, uh, but we want all kinds of endorsements, including individual endorsements. So we hope that some of you will endorse today. Uh, my colleague Duran is going to drop 
a link to the endorsement in the chat. And uh, I hope we will get 20 of you to sign up by the end of this uh, webinar, and we will report back when we get there. And what you're signing on to is a pledge, a public pledge of support for California to accelerate uh, to aggressive, equitable climate policy, um, and that will include that 2030 target. So with that, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Janelle London. And uh, Janelle is the executive director of Cultura. She also leads for Joint Venture Silicon Valley, uh, the Beyond Gasoline campaign. Thank you, Barry. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us here today. Um, it's an exciting day. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about Joint Venture Silicon Valley's new Beyond Gasoline initiative. So as you may well know, uh, transportation is the biggest sector uh, for greenhouse gases and burning gasoline in our cars, trucks and SUVs is the biggest source of that. Um, we are not cutting gasoline consumption the way we need to. So the Beyond Gasoline Initiative's goal is to actually cut gasoline consumption in Silicon Valley 50% by 2030 and in the process advance health equity and prosperity. And so we're doing this by working with cities on policies and goal setting like EV charging ordinances and um, goals like the, like the city of Menlo Parks enacted, which is a, they enacted a goal to cut gasoline sales 10% a year from a pre-pandemic baseline. Uh, we're also working with businesses in Silicon Valley to use less gasoline in their operations and help their employees uh, get to and from work without having to use gasoline. And then for the broader community, we're raising awareness and education on, um, on why and how to cut gasoline use. So we're going to prove to the world how to make a rapid shift away from gasoline by doing it right in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, Silicon Valley is known for disruptive technology and we're going to disrupt their traditional gas car technology. Uh, so that's our that's our initiative, and we look forward to engaging with you guys on on making it real. All right, back to you, Barry. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Janelle. So um, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker. Uh, before I do, I do want to say something. I was remiss in uh, not men mentioning another uh, organization that helped make this webinar possible, which is our partner Actera, who helped promote uh, this webinar. And for those of you who don't know. Uh, Actera is like an institution for sustainability in Silicon Valley, and I highly recommend you check out their website. Um, so with that, um, I have the pleasure of introducing David Burdick, who serves as the Executive Vice President of Business Development at Terra Verde Energy, uh, who has been supporting CCAs and public agencies of all stripes in evaluating and deploying and managing intelligent energy projects. And I just want to share uh, a quick uh, thing, which is we've been working with uh, Terra Verde on a California Energy Commission grant with Marin Clean Energy for about the last year and a half, I guess it is, it's been a while. Um, and they're doing incredible work creating uh, a tool uh, that will help do analysis of distributed energy resources. So we optimize the benefit of those resources for uh, customers, for the grid, for load serving entities. Uh, and this is truly a, a revolutionary thing. We have to get better at deploying these technologies. It's kind of been like the wild west out there. And, and this is a way of bringing really great analysis to uh, just accelerating the development of uh, uh, DER and creating more flexibility on the grid. So uh, kudos to Terra Verde for taking the lead on that. Um, and uh, the other thing I will just tell you about David is I think he is a fantastic presenter. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, David. Excellent, thanks so much, Barry. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thanks for joining us for today's conversation about how to get the most from your existing solar and battery resources. Uh, my name is David Burdick from Terra Verde Energy as I've been introduced here. And we're an independent consulting firm. We work with um, CCAs and public agencies of various types, as well as some commercial enterprises on evaluating and deploying various energy strategies, very focused on uh, right now the deployment of distributed energy resource programs that um, intelligently optimize both the energy, climate, and financial uh, value streams that can be harvested from technologies like solar, 
or battery or EV charging infrastructure or fuel switching of various kinds. Um, our range of services um, spans a pretty wide spectrum from helping load serving entities like CCAs figure out ways that they can unlock some of the value of these resources and then share in that value in the form of incentives or programs that can accelerate and expand the scale of adoption of these technologies within their service territory, which is where I spent a lot of my time and focus um, for Terra Verde. In addition, we help um, organizations like cities, like water agencies, like enterprises or school districts and evaluating what their opportunities are for deploying uh, solar or battery projects that could reduce their electricity expenses, operate as backup power resources during power outages, and we help guide these organizations from idea through implementation of those projects. And then um, another bucket of services that we provide that's really where we're going to be spending a lot of our time in today's discussion is from our asset management services perspective. We represent a portfolio of approaching 400 solar and battery systems and overseeing the ongoing performance and the revenue management and the opportunities that are there, which we'll be talking about, and then providing full transparency into the actual performance of those resources. Um, for many project stakeholders, you know, the key performance indicator for these types of programs um, in a major way is energy cost savings. And that key performance indicator is often difficult to get at because of how uh, the performance of these resources is valued from reduced electricity costs and it's dependent upon how energy is being both generated and manipulated by those uh, resources and how energy is being used at those facilities and our asset management group provides full transparency through uh, a host of resources that we've developed to make that simple and clear uh, for organizations like yours um, but to set the stage for today's conversation, California is leading the charge as it relates to solar and battery technologies. Uh, last year, Terra Verde was proud to join uh, this event hosted by the California Solar and Storage Association in collaboration with one of our clients, Clovis Unified School District, in celebrating the 1 million solar roofs milestone here in California. Um, and then similarly, in California, we are leading the charge um, as it relates to battery energy storage systems with over 35,000 battery energy storage units deployed uh, to date and accelerating at an aggressive pace. Um, you know, the story around batteries is unfortunately colored by these orange skies that many of us in California are familiar with. And given the emergence of these wildfire related public shutoff, uh, power shutoff events, and then having a, a kind of a, a recurrence of rolling blackouts for the first time in the last 19 years, more and more um, homeowners, businesses, local community members are trying to figure out how do we leverage technologies like battery energy storage systems to lower electricity costs and uh, provide backup power when needed. And so today in our conversation, we're gonna be talking about a very kind of specific lens through which to look at these resources. And that is, if you already have solar and battery systems deployed within your organization, how do you get the most out of those resources. And we're gonna look at this through um, two very specific lenses. First, what kind of revenue opportunities exist for solar PV systems in the marketplace today installed at your facilities? And lastly, what are the revenue opportunities for battery energy storage systems? Uh, these two uh, content pieces are commonly overlooked or unexamined opportunities uh, for these types of resources. And so happy to be sharing some of this content with you today. Uh, the first uh, we want to talk about here is the revenue opportunity that exists for solar PV systems through uh, the certification and sale of what are known as renewable energy certificates. And uh, what these renewable energy certificates are is a mechanism to account for the environmental benefits related to clean renewable energy generation. As we're well aware, many of the major power generation sources of old are um, heavy greenhouse gas emissions uh, centers and the environmental benefits of having an alternative renewable energy generation source within a certain territory, uh, those environmental benefits of reduced greenhouse gas emissions can be um, accounted for through this mechanism known as renewable energy certificates or otherwise known as RECs. And how this works is if uh, you're a stakeholder in a renewable energy generation project, 
the energy generation can be reported to an independent tracking system that then accounts for all, all of that renewable generation and then converts that amount of electricity generation into these certificates, these renewable energy certificates. And what, the way it works in uh, the California region is that every megawatt hour of solar generation or renewable energy generation uh, equ equates to one renewable energy certificate. And there's a healthy marketplace for these certificates uh, in California, which again, adds value and adds an economic value stream to these solar projects. Um, there's a host of different types of interested buyers that are operating in the marketplace looking to buy these RECs, uh, ranging from electric utilities who are mandated by the state of California under our renewable portfolio standard to um, have a certain amount of their energy mix coming from renewable energy sources. And they're able to purchase these renewable energy certificates on the wholesale markets uh, to help um, meet those compliance requirements. In addition, companies, maybe yours, um, is also looking to substantiate its uh, reductions in its carbon footprint and doing so by taking various energy um, efficiency measures or deploying your own uh, projects. Um, but for companies that don't have the capacity or the facility footprint to be able to deploy their own projects, they're able to purchase renewable energy certificates to claim the environmental benefits of projects that may be deployed um, elsewhere in the state or in a neighboring uh, region. In addition, there's a really interesting marketplace in California uh, that has spun off of one of the uh, cap and trade programs here in California known as the Low Carbon Fuel Standard Credit Program. This LCFS market um, has a kind of tangential relationship to renewable energy certificates and the participants within the LCFS market are often looking to purchase these renewable energy certificates from projects to increase the economic value of the credits that they're producing in that LCFS market. Some of, some of this is kind of complicated. Happy to dive into some of the details of the Q&A session. So if you have specific questions about this, please feel free to use the Q&A line. But the punchline here is there are a lot of folks out there looking to buy these types of certificates, which creates then that market opportunity. And just to give you a sense of the kind of value stream we're talking about here, our asset management services group has recently negotiated several transactions on behalf of our clients. And you can see here examples from, you know, what kind of organizations are monetizing these certificates and at what level. And so you can see here recently a, a city in Northern California with just one medium sized scale solar facility secured a new purchase and sale agreement for their RECs valued at $20,000 a year. Um, a Southern California water agency that we work with, with their six medium-sized solar facilities, close to $60,000 a year. And then um, earlier this year for a large school district in the Central Valley with 20 smaller solar PV systems are now earning an additional $100,000 a year from that solar portfolio. Now, before you dive into the marketplace of selling your RECs, you do need to understand that there are some marketing claim implications for participating in this type of a program. Uh, and this stems from uh, regulation from the Federal Trade Commission that specifically uh, regulates how organizations address their projects after they sell their uh, renewable energy certificates. And the bottom line here is, is if you're selling your renewable energy certificates, what you're doing is, is you're transferring the rights to claiming the environmental benefits to whomever is buying those certificates from you. So the moment you sell your renewable energy certificates, you're no longer able to make claims that you're using that clean renewable electricity or um, reducing your greenhouse gas emissions or your carbon footprint by a certain percentage based on that project. Um, the EPA has an excellent guidance document. If you're interested, we've put together a little resource that helps organizations think through these marketing claim implications. But you can see here some of the uh, appropriate claims that they've suggested that you can make after you've decided to monetize your RECs. Uh, this example here is we generate solar energy, but we sell it to somebody else. Um, you can talk about how the project reduces your electricity costs. It's um, improving your you know, organization's financial sustainability, but you can't make claims about greenhouse gas emissions reduction or the environmental benefits from your project or that you're using or consuming that clean renewable electricity. Um, here are some examples of what they call unacceptable claims. Um, so if you decide to monetize your RECs, 
claims like we have on-site solar and we're powered by that renewable energy. It's no longer an acceptable claim. So you do need to think through these marketing claim implications and how your organization places a value on being able to track or speak to the amount of greenhouse gas emissions reduction or carbon footprint impacts that your projects are making. But if your organization is interested in monetizing these recs, the process typically follows that first you need to check your solar contracts to find out whether or not your organization does in fact have the rights to these renewable energy certificates. If your project is owned by a third party under a power purchase agreement or you lease your solar facilities, uh, it's very likely that your asset owner that you're paying for those services to is the contractual owner of these renewable energy certificates. There are exceptions to that. So check your contracts. If you own your project, it's likely that you own your RECs. If you have a third party owned project, it's likely that that third party owner has the rights to these RECs. If you do, in fact, own the rights to register and monetize your renewable energy certificates, then there's a process of standing up your program that will include uh, becoming a registered participant on the uh, regional independent tracking system, which is W Regis for the Western US and specifically for the California market. And there's a process to go through there. You'll also need to engage a qualified reporting entity who will be responsible for reporting that data related to your solar production to that tracking system. And this is typically whoever uh, has the contract for your uh, system performance monitoring services. So whoever's providing that service is likely a qualified reporting entity, but they will likely charge you a nominal fee on an annual basis to provide that reporting service to W Regis. Once you've confirmed that you have the rights to Rex, that you've stood up your administrative processes with W Regis, and you have your qualified reporting entity in place, then it's a matter of marketing your RECs to potential buyers to negotiate uh, the terms of a sale agreement, which um, you know the, the scope and scale of those arrangements can vary widely. Um, it's very common to see kind of multi-year terms where uh, organizations will buy all or a portion of your RECs for a period of two, three, five years. In some cases, for the entirety of the life of your project, um, there's, of course, varying price points and um, kind of risks to be considered. In some cases, these purchase and sale agreements are a buy-all, sell-all with no firm volume commitments. In other cases, you can secure better pricing if your organization is willing to commit to a certain level of production on that annual or kind of uh, quarterly basis for your portfolio. And so understanding the terms and where you can create additional value is important. And then um, it's important that if you do decide to deploy this type of a program, that you monitor this program's performance, understanding that uh, if your data communication provider uh, has a gap in their process and isn't reporting those volumes to W Regis, that's opportunity that could be lost, making sure that the transfers are happening appropriately, making sure that you're actually uh, receiving the revenues that you expected before monetizing these recs. So the bottom line here is, is if you have solar PV systems deployed throughout your organization, this is an opportunity that's probably worth looking at. Um, I want to talk now about battery energy storage systems. And again, a commonly unexamined opportunity here that exists for these resources. Again, because of the power interruption events that we've seen here in California, there's been a, a very strong emphasis on battery systems. And the major economic drivers for those batteries is typically reducing your electricity bills through reducing demand charges or playing with the time of use variability of energy pricing in California, where batteries are able to charge in the cheaper energy price times of the day and then discharge against your operations loads in the more expensive hours of the day and, and thereby creating some energy cost savings. But in addition to saving you money on your electricity bills, batteries are able to generate revenue for you as a revenue generating asset. Um, there are emerging programs coming from both CCAs and from the uh, investor owned utilities and from uh, other CPUC driven programs. And I just wanna share with you some of those programs that exist in the marketplace today. In uh, Southern California, the, the CCA Community Choice Energy Aggregator that's serving uh, portions of Los Angeles County and Ventura counties, their um, CPA power response programs uh, provides an opportunity for battery energy storage systems to receive a revenue stream for participating in a demand response type program where 
Clean Power Alliance will have access to uh, calling upon your battery systems to be able to discharge at specific times that creates value for them as a load serving entity. And they pass some of that value along to you and to your organization through that uh, participation revenue stream. Uh, similarly, Silicon Valley Clean Energy, the CCA that serves Silicon Valley, um, joined several others. We're actually working directly with Peninsula Clean Energy, the CCA for San Mateo County, on this same program that's offering an incentive, not a revenue stream, but an incentive for new projects. This is for residential projects, for new solar and battery systems uh, to be deployed within their service territory. And they've structured an agreement with the installer, in this case, Sunrun, who in addition to providing services to the homeowner who's purchasing and installing these new resources, they're also using these same resources to provide value for the CCA, in this case, meeting some of the capacity market obligations, the specific uh, requirement is the resource adequacy obligation of these CCAs. But the, again, the bottom line here is CCAs as a major driver are increasingly looking for ways to create value through these distributed energy technologies. And this creates an opportunity for new projects or existing resources. Um, a project that's available to most customers statewide um, is this demand response auction mechanism program that I wanna unpack a little further since it's likely a possibility that your organization could participate in this regardless of where you're located in the state. Um, this uh, demand response auction mechanism or DRAM program is uh, a program that was deployed by the California Public Utilities Commission in partnership with the investor-owned utilities, PG&E, Southern California Edison, and San Diego Gas and Electric. And what this program provides is a revenue opportunity for battery energy storage systems and technologies to meet California's electricity supply needs in these kind of peak uh, demand hours of the year. Uh, to take us back through where this, where this program came from, it's a relatively new program, um, having kind of been enacted for, uh, from an administrative perspective in 2014, with its first real program year being 2016. But effectively, what this program structures is a, a marketplace for these investor-owned utilities to purchase some of their um, energy services that they need to maintain compliance with the CPUC's requirements. Um, some of the energy services that they need to purchase, they're gonna buy not from large centralized resources, but from decentralized distributed energy resources. Um, and you can see here that the scale of the program started relatively modest with just 40 megawatts of capacity being purchased through this system. And that has nearly 10 X over the four years of the program to date. And how this works is every year, the uh, utilities, they go to market looking for these energy services. And there are companies known as aggregators that will then put together portfolios of resources like batteries or smart thermostats or flexible load technologies of various kinds. And they'll pull together that capacity and then offer that to the utilities. And uh, in some cases, in most cases, there are multiple aggregators that are rewarded a certain amount of capacity for that program year. And then those aggregators are able to then generate revenues um, that then you can share in if you participate in their specific program. Uh, and batteries can participate in this program on, on two different levels. They can, first of all, just participate by being available, not actually being used by the grid for grid services, but simply by being available um, in operating in what's known as the capacity markets your batteries can just by simply being available and on standby, earn a, a modest revenue stream uh, by participating through this program. There are richer, higher risk, but richer incentives for actually participating and discharging your electricity from your battery at these specific times. And you can earn substantially higher revenues if you're able to um, bid into those more aggressive, higher risk, higher reward market opportunities through the program. Um, but before you dive kind of headfirst into something like this, there are some complexities that need to be understood. Um, as I mentioned, you can't, as an organization, just go directly to PG&E uh, to offer these resources. You've got to work direct, indirectly through an aggregator. Um, as I mentioned, getting after some of the richer energy market revenues through this program, they do come at a risk. For example, if 
um, you make the commitment to have your, your batteries available at a certain time. And for whatever reason, your batteries go offline. Um, there's a penalty, a, a, a cost penalty that you'll have to pay for as a result of that um, shortfall in, in providing your resources. So it's important to understand those risks before engaging in a contract to participate in these types of programs. Um, I'll just also mention that your existing battery contracts, depending on how old they are, they may or may not have anticipated the emergence of this type of a marketplace opportunity. So it's important that you understand what are the terms and the conditions of the warranties, the performance guarantees. In some cases, your operating contracts, whoever's responsible for monitoring and actually operating your batteries likely um, have uh, restrictions on or specific terms on how your organization could participate in these types of opportunities um, should you decide to do so. So. Um, just very simply how to go from this is an interesting idea to we're actually generating revenue from our batteries through participating in these programs. The process is first again check your contracts understand the terms and conditions. If this is in fact an opportunity that your contract allows um, then it's engaging the aggregators who have been um, certified in your region uh, and getting multiple uh, proposals from them in terms of how they could envision using your resources to create and then share that value with you. Um, third, evaluating the risks of participation against the other potential uh, value streams that your battery is already dedicated for. So for example, going after these new emerging grid services programs may come into conflict with the demand charge management or energy cost saving strategies that were previously prioritized for your batteries. So you need to understand that. You also need to understand if these batteries are being uh, primarily deployed for backup power, uh, participating in these programs will have to be nuanced by that, making sure that you're not giving away uh, needed capacity from those batteries in the event of an unplanned outage. Once you understand what the opportunities are from aggregators and the risks that could potentially be involved, then it's a matter of negotiating and securing that participation agreement. And then again, it's important that you monitor ongoing program performance. Um, these are by no means set it and forget it type of engagements. They require uh, diligent, active uh, management uh, for the outcomes to be achieved. So with that, if you're interested as an organization in getting an opportunity assessment, if you have some solar and battery resources and want to know, are you saving money? Could you be doing better? Are there you know, opportunities like this that you could be uh, capitalizing on? We would be happy to work with you and, and help you understand what the landscape looks like. And so please feel free to reach out to me directly. My email address is there and I can introduce you to our asset management group, who I'm sure uh, could provide some, uh, some substantial insights into how you could get a better outcome from your existing resources. So with that, I'll pass it back to Barry, uh, who uh, I think is gonna guide us through a little Q and A. Yeah, thank you so much, David. Um, boy, there's a lot to, there's really a lot to know about this. Um, you know, I, I really learned a lot there. Um, and sorry, I didn't mention this earlier, but um, uh, please do use the Q&A function for questions. Um, if you have questions and let's reserve the chat for other comments. Um, and uh, just a reminder, if you haven't had a chance yet, please do endorse Climate Safe California. And then the first question I'm gonna ask, uh, uh, David, if you can give us an example of a, an entity you've worked with and sort of, you know, I don't want you to go into huge detail about it, but just like start to finish, what did it take in terms of time, economic benefit, uh, like how onerous is this uh, if you're working with a third party like Terra Verde or somebody else to uh, to do either, uh, you know, uh, um, renewable energy credits or DRAM or one of the other uh, uh, things that you mentioned? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, the level of effort to participate can range um, depending on, on whether you have um, internal staff members who have a, an expertise in these markets and are prepared to kind of dive into your portfolio of resources. In many cases, that's where our point of entry is with an organization where they, they've done some some energy stuff, but it's not really clear whether or not they do or don't have an opportunity. And so, um, you know, our process is typically a, a stage gate model. We'll, you know, first collect project contracts. Uh, we're able to get 
access to the data, both from an energy use perspective and then the energy resource perspectives, solar and battery, really efficiently, and kind of uh, come to a conclusion in a period of weeks on you know what's the state of the portfolio and what opportunities do or don't exist. From there, you know the what it takes to stand up a program and start generating revenues is typically measured in months. Um, for solar recs, it takes um, at least six to eight weeks to get all of the documentation collected and um, submitted to W Regis to get your solar facilities uh, registered and able to generate recs if you aren't already doing so. Um, and then securing the right purchase and sale contracts is a relatively swift process, but we manage a highly competitive process that um, is iterative and drives best value from the marketplace. So it's typically, you know, think of it in terms of three to four weeks for an opportunity analysis, and then it's two to three months to actually stand up the revenue and asset management program. Great, thank you. That that was that was really helpful for me to frame like you know timing and and what's involved for an organization. Uh, so here's a question from the audience. Um, is there a spot market capability for selling excess renewable energy as RACs? So to be clear, when you're selling renewable energy certificates, you're not selling the electricity. You're selling the um, certified environmental benefits. And th those are two kind of separate products, right? So if you have um, excess energy, um, as an organization, your resources are likely interconnected through a net energy metering program and your excess solar generation is accounted for through that program. It's being delivered to your local utility company. Um, they're then either crediting that towards your bill or if you're net exporting over the course of the year, you're getting somewhere between two to four cents a kilowatt hour for that. Um, your RECs, however, there are there is a spot market for that. So you could take just a small portion of your RECs, go to market and say, I've got this amount available today for purchase. Is anybody interested? And there are folks, you know, as I mentioned, across these various types of buyers who are looking for volumes to kind of uh, meet those last kind of volumes that they hadn't otherwise secured under previous contracts. So there is a spot market for RECs for sure. Great. Um... Can you provide an example of adding RECs to LCFS credits in terms of registering those credits, selling them, and the, uh, and the increase in value? Yeah, this is one of those places that's super interesting as it relates to renewable energy certificates. So um, we work um, extensively with transit agencies, uh, California High Speed Rail, Caltrain, Samtrans, BART, and others. And um, the LCFS program provides a means of accounting for the uh, environmental benefits of using lower carbon emission fuel sources for transportation. Um, and so um, electric vehicle charging, whether it's at a um, you know, commercial scale or at this kind of transit agency scale can participate in those types of programs. Those LCFS credits um, the amount of credits that you're able to generate is specifically tied to how much fuel you're using from that lower carbon emission source and then the carbon intensity of that fuel source. So if you're using grid electricity, you can only uh, accumulate a certain amount of credits. But if you're using zero or in some cases negative carbon intensity fuels, um, the amount of credits for the same amount of electricity is much larger because the environmental benefits of that fuel switching is much larger. And so essentially um, pairing the purchase of renewable energy certificates with your portfolio of um, lower emissions fuel systems, electrified systems in many cases, can increase the a number of credits that you're producing from the same amount of electrification and thereby you can create more value by selling a higher volume of those credits. We can get into the specifics of the LCFS market if there's you know, further interest in that from a Q&A perspective. And feel free to reach out to me if this was your question and you want to dive into that in more detail. Thank you. Now, uh, this one might, uh, you might have to say, uh, oh, we need a consulting phone call to talk about this, but uh, I'll see if you can give a brief response. If we are considering the repowering and or expansion of our existing 
2011 one megawatt rooftop solar system, which is in PG&E service territory, what are some rules of thumb for how high our current PPA rate must be and how much our RECs would roughly be worth if we desire to go that route to make the buyout and per, uh, pursuing either of those paths economical? That's a great question. And I think you're, at, you're asking a lot of the right questions. And this is a place that so many are, are, um, are facing now with uh, a lot of power purchase agreements that were deployed over the last you know, 15 years or so. Um, some of those older PPAs are now coming up to their either their first buyout opportunities or they're you know, coming up to a, uh, an expiration of their term. And so um, this does require kind of an independent assessment. It, it requires an understanding of the terms and conditions of your contract relative health of the asset, if it's, you know, well performing, what's the expected remaining useful life, um, an unexamined uh, kind of dynamic within solar systems that the panels themselves, the, you know, beautiful rectangles, um, those are, are expected uh, and typically warranted for a period of 20 to 30 years. But um, some of the major components for converting that electricity into usable electricity at your facilities, namely the inverters, the big boxes that turn that solar power into the kind of energy your facilities use, those are typically uh, warranted for a 10 to 15 year period. And there's an expectation that you're gonna have to replace those um, to, to reach the end of the useful life for your plant. And so, you know, it's, it's a matter of A, looking at your contract, B, looking at the health of your asset. Um, C, it looks like if you're expanding, it's, it's understanding what are the implications of that expansion? Do you in fact need that? Could you get some reward there? So this does require typically an assessment where someone looks into your contract, looks into how you're using and generating electricity and then provides you with kind of an opportunity assessment that says, here's your status quo outcome. Here's what a buyout would look like. Here's some of the strategies you could uh, levy against that. And that's the kind of work we do on a regular basis for lots of organizations. Great, thank you so much for that. That was that was definitely uh, uh, a a good quick consulting call. <laughs> um, is there uh, any example of aggregated residential solar PV systems par participating in rec sales? Um, so, yes, from the perspective of power providers. Uh, so, if you're a uh, a company that's in the business of uh, installing and owning these uh, residential rooftop solar resources. Um, it is likely that many of those uh, residential systems are being aggregated and that power provider who's providing those energy resources to those customers is then monetizing the renewable energy certificates related to that portfolio. I personally have not seen a coalition of homeowners or residential solar customers that own their systems banding together to secure those kinds of contracts. It's really uh, until you're reaching, you know, the the, the value you know, until you've got thousands of solar panels involved, the, the economics just aren't there. The juice isn't worth the squeeze to stand up the program. But once you've got, you know, a, a portfolio of commercial scale systems or some larger uh, energy resources, that's where this market starts to become really interesting. Great. Um, so this is a question about um, DRAM. Uh, what technology is best for DRAM? Do CCAs provide guidance for new developments? Um, so those two questions. So first, what technologies are, are, are interesting as it relates to DRAM? As I mentioned, batteries is an interesting technology. Um, smart thermostats is another technology that uh, these aggregators are, are targeting and leveraging. And then um, if you have any uh, building management systems or energy management systems that can operate and, and um, control your loads, um, that allows you to kind of flex either turning on or off substantial amounts of load, that load flexibility is also a technology that can be recognized and monetized with that DRAM program. So if you have solar, uh, excuse me, if you have batteries, uh, smart thermostat technologies, building management or energy management systems that have controls capabilities, all of that's really interesting from a DRAM perspective. And then CCAs are um, providing various levels uh, of um, kind of program support uh, as it relates to kind of exploring or capitalizing on some of these opportunities. In some cases, as I mentioned, they're actually 
finding ways to monetize these values themselves and then pass that through either in the form of an incentive or some kind of shared revenue. Um, in other cases, uh, we're working with, for example, Sonoma Clean Power in the Sonoma County and Mendocino County regions, and they're providing through our firm technical assistance to um, a large portfolio of their local government and school customers and getting kind of a free paid for by Sonoma Clean Power technical and financial feasibility assessment for these types of energy storage projects. And so, again, uh, working with CCAs couldn't be more proud of the kind of very prominent and uh, strong leadership position that they're exhibiting in driving forward this distributed energy future. Yeah, and I would just tag on to that and say, if you're in a CCA service territory, um, most all of them have, you know, business, business accounts specialists or a program director, and I would contact them directly to find out what programs they're offering because they certainly aren't uniform, but most of them are working in this space. Yeah, and I mean, this is a, for CCAs, you know, the, the complexity for these types of programs is significant. Our, our firm is focused on trying to simplify the complexities and, um, you know, kind of overcome these barriers for CCAs so they're able to kind of accelerate the deployment and the scale of these programs. But uh, they are working hard. Almost every CCA operating in the state of California have programs of various kinds for both their residential and business customers, even those that have only been operating and serving customers for a year or two. So uh, Barry's right. Reach out to your CCA. Their programs team has likely multiple offerings that your team could be looking at. And, and this is another CCA related question. It says, does the purchase of RECs by large businesses compete with CCAs to deliver uh, resource to the community? Yes and no. Um, so some CCAs are buying renewable energy certificates. Um, the, many of them, that's kind of a, an early strategy that's deployed like every load serving entity in the state. And then ag as aggressively as they can, they're contracting for large renewable projects or renewable programs that put them in the stakeholder position to where they can claim those recs. Um, so as more and more buyers are operating in the market, that does compete. Um, I would say flip side as it relates to our conversation here, if you're able to generate renewable energy certificates, you could be selling those directly to your CCA or indirectly through an aggregated purchase that they're making. So you could be actually supporting their kind of path towards providing greener electricity for your community. Um, but yes, in some cases you could be competing with them um, from a buyer's perspective. Um, and we've only got time for really one more question, I think. Um, let's see. No, oh, that one's a little bit out of scope, but um, how about, this is kind of a different question, David, see, see what you think about it. Well, what do you, uh, what do you see uh, for DC microgrids, uh, a la uh, SB uh, 1339, and energy efficient buildings, all at a city block scale in mitigating the rolling California blackouts? So a, a little bit yeah. out of the scope of this conversation, but an interesting question. Yeah, so there's a couple of things. One, California needs cheaper, cleaner, more reliable electricity. And one of the major technology resources we need is energy storage to get there. And California is in some ways leading and in some ways lagging as a marketplace towards recognizing and finding ways to monetize the value of these battery or other resources. I mean, for example, you know, our firm has helped deploy over 100 megawatts of solar and battery systems across the state of California. And in some cases, the um, capacities deployed by those projects um, deferred distribution infrastructure investment in the hundreds of millions of dollars, and not a penny of that investment deferral was monetized or recognized as a value stream for those projects. Um, hmm. The deployment of, you know, even residential scale solar and battery systems at scale community wide has massive implications for modernizing and stabilizing our grid. And there's, there's, we're early stage in working on efforts to try to create the marketplace for those value streams to be monetized. What we're really interested in is the FERC order 2222, which at a national level 
has been enacted, but at the local level in the CAISO California market, it's going to take a couple of years before actual programs start to roll out. But these are the kinds of signals that are saying the, the energy market is ready to kind of evolve. It needs to evolve and it's ready to evolve towards a future where technologies of various kinds and the, the values that can be provided by those can get recognized and monetized. Now, there's a lot of challenges on deploying microgrids across multiple customer locations um, from a uh, kind of regulatory perspective and then from a uh, partnership perspective with the distribution system operators. So there's a lot of complexities that need to get simplified. The Climate Center is doing a lot of work to help drive policy that will change and simplify that. Um, we're actively partnered on that and, and working towards that, but I expect that to be a long, complicated journey um, not one that we expect to see near-term results in, but it's a definite. It's definitely a part of the equation. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try one more uh, question, and uh, I'll, this is a doozy, um, and you only have about a minute to answer it. Sorry about that. Um, Great, but but it is a good one. Um, how does the rec market enable dirty power sources to emit and reduce the ability to achieve climate change goals? So it's kind of a high level one about yeah. Rex and your here's, viability. Here's my thought on, on Rex. I mean, the idea of renewable energy certificates is that it creates a value stream for those renewable projects. I like that that exists because um, it creates opportunity to deploy more projects and get more resources onto the grid. I mean, arguably monetizing Rex from existing resources is less interesting from a moving the needle from a climate perspective than incorporating the renewable energy certificate revenue streams into new projects and programs. Um, but I'll tell you, there's a, an innovative program where um, we'll be deploying in Q1 of next year with a CCA in Southern California where their ability to um, bring the renewable energy certificates from the solar that will be incentivized through that program um, that is a, without that revenue stream or without that cost savings benefit of, of being able to own those recs, that program probably would not make financial sense for this organization, but it moves the needle that much for them. So if that marketplace is accelerating the deployment of more resources, then I say it's, it's, it's achieving its objective. Now, if, uh, organizations who have no real commitment to, um, uh, sustainability or simply using RECs to buy their way into compliance. You know, obviously that's a, you know, a crutch we wouldn't want to provide. We want to see, you know, mission level change. Um, however, there are the right types of organizations with the right mission alignment who are leveraging that marketplace to accelerate the kind of programs we want to see. So the Great. net outcome is it's a benefit to the market. Great. Thank you so much, David. Um, we're going to leave it there, um, except I'm going to just ask you quick, um, how do people follow up with you if they're interested in talking more about uh, these uh, different mechanisms? Feel free to reach out to me directly, david at terraverde.energy. And um, the uh, slide deck will be, I'm sure, sent out as a follow up to the webinar. And my, uh, my contact information is there. We're happy to talk about what your organization is thinking about and how we might help. Great. Thank you so much, David. And um, let's see, in wrapping up, uh, I want to thank again our partners, Terra Verde Energy, uh, Actera for their work. Um, and do we have either Duran or Nina an update on endorsements? Oh, it looks like our account is in. Um, it's at six. Um, so that's a little bit below our target, but the good news is it's not too late after the webinar. You can get on the website and still endorse. So thank you for the folks who did. And then in closing, I just want to say, um, that uh, we are doing a whole webinar series on Climate Safe California uh, and how it works and the pathways to getting to net negative emissions by 2030. And that is going to kick off on January 26th at 10 a.m. And our first presenter is uh, Ben Santer, a PhD from Lawrence Livermore National Labs, who is going to speak about the current science and uh, what target seems to be dictated by the current science. So I hope you all can join us then. Uh, and thank you all for being with us. Thank, big thanks to you all for attending. Uh, hope you'll follow up with uh, David and feel free to follow up with me. 
about any issues around Climate Safe California. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks, everybody.